We're here for the Judging Bush Conference. I think it'll be a, a lot of fun. And to welcome us to Golden University, it's my honor to introduce a, a wonderful person I was lucky to work with for many, many years here. Um, and also a very good scholar, a uh, congressional scholar, um, a PhD from Harvard, used to teach at one of our alumni, Marquette, but the last 15 years has been here at Villanova uh, as, uh, uh, as Vice President for Academic Affairs, uh, my friend Jack Johannes. Thank you, good morning everyone. Um, I am pleased on behalf of our President, Father Peter Dunahaven, on behalf of the entire university to welcome you all to Villanova. Um, the, the conference today, uh, Judging Bush, is, is obviously an important topic, and, and not just for, for those of us in the scholarly world. Um, the world and national situation, as we all know, is, is best characterized as a mess today, and people are asking for accountability, and they're asking questions about the future and about the past, of course. And as I, and this conference is just perfect because the question that I hear most in my classes is, how much is President Bush to blame for the situation we have today? What has he done well? What has he done poorly? And I've got more than a, a passing interest. As Bob, Bob mentioned, I used to teach course in the presidency as well as a course on Congress. And these kinds of questions <clears throat> are perennial, but they seem more, more intense today. But I think the questions that I would have in my mind, and I hope some of the questions that you have in your mind, go beyond just President Bush and the presidency. Uh, I was just whipping through the computer the other day looking at, at some speeches and lectures I'd given over the years, and I ran across some titles which, which kind of spoke volumes to me. One of the titles was, What's Wrong with Washington? Another one is, Why Congress Can't Govern? And the third is, Why Political Reform Never Works? Uh, <laughs> You might say I'm a little cynical, but, but I think these are the kinds of questions that go beyond the presidency, but yet encompass the presidency so well. And I hope that uh, in your conversations today, we can get to some of those, those broader questions as well. Uh, again, I, I welcome you to Villanova. If you have a chance, please wander around the campus. This is a university that has changed immensely, and I do mean immensely, in the last 15 or 20 years. The nature of the place uh, has changed, the quality of the students and faculty has uh, skyrocketed, and we've managed to build a few buildings in the process. The one thing about the university that we take great pride in is our sense of community here, a sense of hospitality. Um, so please avail yourselves of that opportunity, and in about two hours, the students, after they wake up, will come in and join them, but it'll take a while. So again, welcome, and best wishes on a great conference. I'm, most of you know me, I'm Bob Moranta, the conference director. I'm the, the endowed chair of leadership in the Department of Education Reform at the University of Arkansas, the only one of its country, uh, in the country, the only one of its kind in the country. But um, before that, for the last eight years, I was here at Villanova, and Villanova is an absolutely wonderful place. Uh, I can't imagine a, a better run, more decent university. And my very first job was at the University of Southern Mississippi, where Tom Lansford, uh, who's one of my co-editors in this project, uh, uh, is now. Uh, another wonderful university, and they all have, have some great things in, in common. Um, one is, they all have some diversity of views, which I find a lot of fun. They're Democrats, they're Republicans, they're people, people throwing around ideas. They all have people who are both scholars, but also practitioners, which I think is another very, very important thing, to have people who have actually been in the real world. A number of the people who will be presenting today are folks who've actually worked in the White House, in Congress, in the executive branch, and, and elsewhere. And I think that that leads us to have somewhat more tempered judgments than those who've never, who've never been there. Um, I, I think it, it also it leads to a greater sense of toleration. People who may disagree, uh, nonetheless getting along together and not being uh, disagreeable. Um, uh, tentativeness, I think, is very important, and not something we always see in politics, especially with President Bush, who is, of course, very controversial. Uh, has been for, for some time. I have here a couple of, a couple of cute things. I have here, uh, before the 2004 election, or around that time, this t-shirt with monks the screen, saying Bush again, uh, was one example. Uh, I have some, uh, some mints here that you couldn't see probably in the audience, but their national embarrassment was with, with George W. Bush. Um, and, and, you know, people both pro and con, probably more con, have some very strong views in the presidency. I remember a, a, a Mother Jones 
cover story with Bush after the 2004 election is a vampire sucking the blood out of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, the, um, I, I would argue for, for more tempered judgments. Uh, history is usually a little kinder to uh, what are seen as failed presidents than we are at the time. And oftentimes, those of us making judgments simply aren't right. Back in the 80s, I was writing about what a poor President Reagan was. Luckily, none of that, none of that stuff was published. Um, in the 90s, after serving in Washington and after the end of the Cold War, looking back on it, I thought Reagan was actually a very good president. Uh, now I put him in the top six or seven. Um, the American people maybe had better judgment on that than I did. So I would argue for, for some passion, yes, and, and energy of ideas, but also some tentativeness in our judgments, and certainly respect for those with different judgments. We have, we have a, an outstanding lineup of people today. You can read their bios in the program, or you can look at them on, on the website. Uh, I want to apologize to Karen Holt. Her, her bio wasn't up there. And it should be. She won the Newstat Award. She's an outstanding scholar. I also want, uh, before, I, before I turn this over to the, the other folks here, to mention the people who made this conference possible. Our three sponsors, of course, the University of Southern Mississippi, the University of Arkansas, and, uh, and Villanova University. But in particular, a great thing with Villanova is a very, very good uh, master's program in political science and, uh, uh, and also public administration. And this program would not have been going on except, except for one of my conference co-directors, Jeremy Johnson, who is an outstanding PhD candidate at Brown now, will be on the job market this fall, He's co-editing the book with us, uh, has done a huge amount of work here. My, my associate at the uh, University of Arkansas, Dirk Van Ramdon, who's out in the audience, has done a huge amount of work. And um, probably more than anyone else, Neil, can you stand up a second? Um, Neil Reedy, about five years ago, was a master's student here in political science, who also had been a Villanova undergraduate, and wanted to write this, this cockamamie thesis on presidential greatness. And David Barrett, the presidency expert, and I said, Neil, don't do that. It's a flaky field of literature. It's too slippery. There's nothing very concrete there. You won't get anything good out of it. And Neil persisted and insisted, and he wrote one of the best, probably the best master's thesis I've ever seen. And that led David and I to spend years talking about this issue, and, and ultimately decide, make a, a bunch of us, to decide to put on this conference. And when the book comes out next year, Neil and, and Jeremy are lead authors, are, are the authors of, uh, of the lead chapter. And the framework that, that Neil suggests, is, is that Neil and, and, and also Jeremy too put together is the one we're using. Uh, I think an important thing for a good professor is you have to admit when you're wrong, and you have to also learn from your learn from your students. A lot of times they come up with things that, that you wouldn't have, uh, and that's the spirit I think we have at, at all three institutions: Southern Miss, Villanova, and, and University of Arkansas. Okay, I've taken way too long a time, so let me briefly introduce our, our first session. Again, you can read the the speakers' bios in the program. Um, uh, we're going to start off with, with Jeremy Johnson, who's a counter who's a, a former Villanova master's student and a counterterrorism um, expert for the U.S. government. Uh, and Jeremy Johnson, our, our, our PhD candidate at Brown, who will be uh, who will be talking about presidential greatness generally. And then I will follow up. Richard Redding cannot be here, so I will follow up with a piece on President Bush's uh, psychology and how that led to some successes and I think he, some even greater failures. And I, and I think he explains a lot of what. Uh, went both right and wrong uh, with this administration. And with that, let me turn it over to Neil and Jeremy. I think Jeremy first, right? Right. Thank Jeremy you. Johnson. Just for the record, I am not an expert on counterterrorism. Neil Reedy is. <laughs> but I am a PhD student at Brown University, and I appreciate the opportunity for being here today, and I look forward to hearing all the panelists and discuss discussions later on throughout the, uh, throughout the session. Okay, evaluating presidents is a notoriously hazardous and often sloppy enterprise. Establishing ob objective criteria removed from partisan preferences is an elusive goal for scholars, journalists, and the public. Yet such chief executives as Franklin Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln consistently rank at the top of these surveys, while Warren Harding, Franklin Pierce, and yes, Pennsylvania's own James Buchanan are generally found at the bottom. Perhaps the most common characteristic of high-ranking presidents is the energy and exuberance of the, of the executive during times of crisis. They do not fear testing the boundaries of presidential powers. Conversely, less well-regarded presidents fail to offer energetic leadership or bold policy proposals, especially during some crisis times. Perhaps taking this lesson to heart, George W. Bush, the nation's 43rd chief executive, determined to leave his mark on the nation and the presidency. Elected without a popular mandate in 2000, he still chose to govern assertively. 
pushing an often controversial domestic agenda. Moreover, moreover after the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, he promoted a robust, indeed explosive, foreign policy. Bush aggressively pushed policy, from cutting taxes to education reform, since the opening days of his administration. However, mere exuberance does not presidential greatness make. Action is a double-edged sword, letting a president seize opportunity while also serving as a trap. The presidency, in the words of presidential scholar Stephen Skoranek, works best as a battering ram, demolishing old, enervated systems. It does not function as well building a new structure to replace the discarded model. A president needs a sense when the time is right for assertive leadership. <clears throat> Typically, greatness, in quotes, has been thrust on a president due to both national and interna international crises. This is the, a dilemma that Bush, like all pre his presidential counterparts, has had to negotiate. He had, how adroitly and competently, competently did Bush and his entourage govern during his eight years in office? Bush has certainly has, has had his share of crisis events. Early in his presidency, 9-11 tragically occurred, and he's ending his tenure in office with an economic and financial crisis that reverberates on a scale of virtually unprecedented magnitude. After reading the papers from this distinguished group of scholars, it is clear some believe that Bush did indeed take advantage of his opportunity for exercising powerful leadership. But other scholars would argue that Bush chose not to respond in ways appropriate for the situation at hand. Further, some would even suggest that he imagined opportunities that were not really there. We'll be hearing these um, opinions of these scholars throughout the course of today. Uh, and they are opinions. Ranking presidents is a parlor game that has existed for a very long time. Arthur Schlesinger Sr. formally pioneered this genre in the November 1948 edition of the Venerable Life magazine, where he asked historians to rank the presidents in categories ranging from great to failure. There's five categories from great to failure. On the body of the introductory chapter, which Neil and I co-authored, um, uh, seeks to move beyond somewhat arbitrary rankings to offer an assessment and evaluation of various theories that scholars have used to judge presidents. I will not rehash these interpretive schemes here today. You will have to read the eventual book. <laughs> Except to say that Neil Reedy, who wrote a thesis on presidential greatness, will say a few words about foreign policy, which he argues in his thesis is a key determinant for presidential greatness. But before Neil Reedy comes up, I have two final words of caution. There is currently strong disagreement among the public when evaluating President Bush. During Bush's contentious 2004 re-election campaign, over 90% of Republicans approved of Bush's handling of the job, while conversely only 15% of Democrats approved. This was the biggest gap between partisans in assessing how the President has handled his job in the history, in the recorded history of polling. Even today, approximately 70% of Republicans approve of the job that George Bush is doing, with numbers much lower for both Democrats and Independents. No band of scholars, however distinguished, can, can remove themselves totally from the grip of such high hyper-partisanship, no matter how accomplished they are. This conference will, will by no means be the last word assessing Bush. My final thoughts relates to attributing too much to historical agency, too much historical agency to a single individual. Thomas Carlyle, in 1841, formulated the premise that great men alone determine historical outcomes. He wrote a book entitled On Heroes, Hero Worship, and the Heroic in History. Such a position is no longer tenable and would make my his colleagues who are historians cringe. Nonetheless, the President of the United States makes decisions of great consequences, of great consequence, and serves as a symbol for America's interests. Thus, George W. Bush must be judged, as is all presidents, for both his accomplishments and his failures. I'll now turn this over to Neil Reedy. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, great to be back here at Villanova. I uh, just wanted to say a few words about the thesis I wrote. Um, what, what intrigued me about presidential, presidential scholarship was that it was an attempt by uh, academics to do something that voters do every four years, namely judge presidential performance. Uh, and my thesis was written during 2004 to 2005, and as everyone knows, the debate over the U.S.-led wars in Iraq and Afghanistan was front and center on everybody's mind. Um, my thesis didn't focus on um, these events or Bush's presidency exclusively. 
Um, but the debate was certainly as on my mind as I was writing it because uh, judging presidential performance um, still remained a very subjective among academics and also um, among voters. There was no independent standard. Um, and what I was looking for in researching uh, our previous scholarship was an articulate academic explanation of what defines a good or a bad president. And frankly, I didn't, I didn't, find, I didn't find one out there. Uh, some, theory, some theories I felt were stronger than others and they were reviewed in the thesis. Um, but as Jeremy alluded to earlier, um, what I found most remarkable was the agreement among scholars and the general public on who is a good president and who is a bad president. Um, mentioned FDR, usually Washington and Lincoln are at the top. Um, and I think that the fact that there's so much agreement among scholars and uh, the voters, uh, that I infer that there is, there is some objective standard, uh, some objective criteria out there that both uh, scholars and the public agree upon. And my particular thesis, with the focus was foreign policy and Woldowski's two presidencies thesis, which argued that the U.S. president had the most ability to affect foreign policy. Um, I think it's best, the, the best quote I could find on this was from JFK, and he was consulting with Nixon on uh, Cuban issues. Uh, the quote itself is R-rated, so I will uh, tone it down here. Uh, it's true that foreign affairs is the only important issue for a president to handle. Who cares if the minimum wage is $1.15 or $1.25 in comparison to these issues? And obviously, when I'm writing the thesis in 2004 to 2005, we have the Iraq and Afghanistan wars going on, same mindset. Uh, the focus of this book, uh, however, is going to be on selecting those scholarly presidential theories which most aptly capture the criteria which should be used, which should be used to judge a president and apply that criteria to George Bush uh, to include foreign policy. And again, as Jer Jeremy alluded to the political environment, what, whatever your politics, I think everyone can agree that judging George Bush's presidency is going to be very, very interesting. Um, the, uh, I personally think that the verdict will be decided many, many years down the line. Um, and we can also see several instances where a president's stock, so to speak, will either rise or fall. It doesn't necessarily matter if you're uh, very popular or unpopular at the end of your term, but um, once history casts your judgment, that's, that's basically your place in time. Um, Harry Truman is, I think, a good example of that when he left very unpopular, but today is considered pretty successful. Um, and I think uh, George Bush's presidency will probably depend on the fate of democratization in the Middle East, as I think foreign policy is the most important. Um, and just finally, I'd like to say that I think it's, although this is described as sometimes a sloppy enterprise, I think it is important to come up with some, with some standards and have, uh, have a goal, have, have the debate over the presidency framed uh, within some reasonable standards. Like you can be wildly uh, you know, pro-Bush or whatever president or against him, but I think if, you're, if you frame the debate within reasonable ex expectations, I think it would, it would certainly be beneficial. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over. Um, inside Bush's brain, no, not Karl Rove. And we say that because of the, the famous book, Bush's Brain, uh, talking about Karl Rove. Um, Bush actually has a brain on his own. He's, he's not a mere creature of Karl Rove. And, but before I, I get into that, um, think about what we want in a president. When you, when you talk to people and when you look on you know, the West Wing and shows like that, Americans want in a president, leaders generally, people who are, people who are decisive, people who are bold, uh, who are willing to take some risks, who have courage who have some idealism, who are re really trying to make the world a better place and not just trying to get reelected. Um, they want a certain level of populism. We're, we're a populistic country. Uh, populist meaning we don't really trust experts all the time. Um, and we certainly don't like people who think they're better than we are. Uh, something that, that, that is interesting about Americans, Americans really don't dislike rich people. Um, we, we think, you know, perhaps incorrectly, that Bill Gates is kind of a friendly nerd. He's not, you know, he's not necessarily a geeky guy. Ross, Ross Perot, you know, is a guy you, you might have a beer with. Um, we don't dislike rich people. We dislike snobs. We dislike rich people who act like they're better than we are. We dislike academics who think that they're better than we are, act like they're better than we are, and so on down the line. We Americans are much more concerned about social equality than economic equality. So we want a president who, in some sense, is kind of a regular guy. Um, Barack Obama went to went to, edited Harvard Law Review. Clearly, he's not a regular guy, but you know has to talk about his, his kids and you know basketball and, and football playoffs and stuff like that to make himself seem 
more like a regular guy, and all presidents have to do that. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush ate pork rinds and so on. I think that's something we, we fail to capture sometimes when we look at presidents. We want presidents, uh, America's, Americans are very religious people. Uh, I think it was Ben Wattenberg who once joked that, uh, that Americans are, are, are about the most religious people in the Western world. Uh, our leaders are generally not. Uh, he once made the, made the remark that Americans are like, like the people of India governed by Swedes. We're very religious people governed by very secular people. Uh, we want presidents who are, or at least pretend to be, people of faith. Uh, only one member of Congress has had the bravery to say he's, he's an atheist. Uh, it's generally not a good way to win election. Um, uh, and we want a president who takes his or someday her family seriously. You can see that coming out with the, with the Sarah Palin thing this year. Can you run when you have five kids? And and so on. So these are the things that we say we want, and I think actually kind of do want in a leader. Um, presidency scholars, academics generally are a little different. We like the decisiveness. We like the boldness, at least to some degree, although not so much in foreign policy as in domestic policy, which maybe reflects what academics tend to care more about, academics generally being a little more left of center. We certainly want the idealism. We want a president with a vision to try to make the country great. I think it's something everyone agrees on. Academics, on the other hand, like intellectualism. We like someone who can, or at least can pretend to have read uh, the great works and more current works and can you know, string some sentences together. What does Saturday Night Live say after Obama was elected? Well, now for four years, we'll have a president who says, who says nuclear instead of nuclear. Uh, the um, uh, so sort of uh, academics are, are not so populist in that, in that sense. Academics also generally, even presidency scholars who are relatively conservative as these things go, like presidents who have boldly expanded the state. Um, a friend of mine, Andy, uh, Andrew Prendel at, at the University of Arkansas, who teaches presidency studies, um, who's somewhat sympathetic to this view, but also very self-aware, said, you know, I, I sometimes wonder if teaching presidency in American political development is just teaching how the state gets ever bigger. Uh, we define great presidents not as those who ditched problems or those who failed to do something uh, that was unwise, but as presidents who boldly expanded government. Uh, I don't know if that's always the best thing or not. Reagan, to some degree, is an exception, but generally that's, that's how presidency scholars view, uh, view presidents or, or judge presidents. That's our criteria. Now, W studies, George W. Bush studies. Who is George W. Bush, to kind of flip topics a little bit? Um, uh, we have hagiographies of, of Bush, one written by my friend Stan Renshaw about how Bush should be on Mount Rushmore, basically. We need to carve a, an extra part of the granite there. Um, and, and then we have a, a lot of, uh, of, of very anti-Bush books, Bush on the Couch, for example, and lots of others about what an evil, shallow, whatever man this is. Um, and, I, and I think both are clearly a little, a little off. My colleague Richard Redding, is a, uh, along with being a lawyer, is a psychologist and knows this literature very well. And he and I argue a lot about this, but he, I, th I think, has convinced me that there is some fairly good work on, on Bush's brain. Um, uh, and so what do, we, what do we have to judge Bush? Well, we have intelligence tests. Uh, we have his SATs, which are actually pretty good, better than John Kerry's, as I recall. Um, you know, the, on the renormed SAT, it would be about a 1,300, you know, very respectable. Um, the uh, top 10% of the population, top 15% or so of, of college students. Um, and, and in fact, we, we uh, well, I'll get into this later. What else do we have? We also have double blind studies of W personality, of W, so of Bush's personality. W blind means it's sort of the person being rated doesn't know about it, and the person rating them doesn't know who they're rating, which obviously Bush isn't going to know or care that some some psychology students are rating him somewhere. But um, we have actually had some good studies where um, uh, we've given long segments of Bush statements, along with other presidents' statements, um, to trained raters who have rated them on different cognitive characteristics, you know, intelligence, cognitive complexity, et cetera. And those are, are probably fairly good studies as far as they go. We've done that actually with, I think, all the presidents now. Um, we also have biographical accounts. My favorite, which, which actually Richard doesn't use, I think it's very good, Al Felsenberg up here told me about it, is um, uh, The Bush Tragedy by New Republic uh, writer Jacob Weisberg. I, I would recommend that to anyone. Uh, the, uh, so we, we, we do have some sense of, of who this guy is, I think, aside from the he's great, he's horrible, sort of simplistic approach. Uh, so who is he? What are his characteristics? Um, George W. Bush is smart. You know, there's nothing dumb about George W. Bush. And uh, Mike Moreland down in the audience has worked with him, and I, I'll... I don't know if you want to talk about that or not, but I think he and anyone else who's worked with the president can attest to the fact that this is not a dumb guy. This is a guy who's clearly smart enough to be president and probably smarter than most of us who are rating him. Uh, as Alexander Pelosi put it, hey, I'm judging him, but I ain't the president. I couldn't quite get there. Uh, the, um, 
Uh, he's a very smart guy, but, but in intelligence, he does seem to be in the bottom quarter of presidents. Presidents are all really bright. <laughs> you know, I think any of them could come in here and kind of own the room. Um, uh, but, uh, so he's very bright. He's clearly bright enough to be president. I mean, not one of our sharper presidents, but clearly smart enough for the job. Probably comparable to Eisenhower, to, to Reagan. Um, uh, but relatively simple, smart but simple. Low integrative complexity. What does that mean? I forgot to warn people to turn off their cell phones. It means he, he, he thinks often in relatively black and white terms and sometimes has trouble putting himself in the position of, of others. Um, he's also, he's not neurotic. This is not a Woody Allen president. This is not Jimmy Carter. Should I do this? Should I do that? Am I a good president? Am I a bad president? Um, and, which is probably a good thing that he's not going that far, but he may have erred too much in the other direction. Um, he's also not his father who is more like that, more, more pondering in some ways. He is, uh, as one uh, psych psychological treatment put it, dominant and decisive. He, uh, he's aggressive, he pushes things, he's energetic, he knows what he wants to do, he tries to do it, and then he doesn't look back, he doesn't revisit decisions. Um, in some policy circumstances, that could be exactly the right thing to do. In some, it could be exactly the wrong thing to do. I think one theme we can take out of the psychology literature is, is that those who are looking for objective criteria are gonna be a little off because psychological characteristics that could be extremely successful in one situation could be terrible failures in, in another. Winston Churchill, very decisive, steadfast leader, great in World War II, terrible in World War I, um, different situations. Um, Bush is certainly very energetic. Uh, he doesn't work as hard as most presidents. Uh, probably because he really, he actually loves his family. Most politicians don't really have families except for photo opportunities that kind of drag them out when the press is there and they don't really see them. Um, Bush actually loves his wife and kids uh, and spends a huge amount of time with them and actually would rather be with them than on the cam campaign trail, which is very far into, you know, Bill Clinton, Al Gore, lots of other <laughs> politicians who are out there. Um, uh, but he is, he is very energetic. He wants to do lots of stuff. He is very idealistic. He does want to make the country a better place. I don't think George Bush set out to be a failed president. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Bush has a healthy family life. Again, very unusual for politicians. You want a real politician? Uh, Jeb Bush, maybe. George W. Bush, no. He's not a real politician. He's, he's too... The, the demands of the job are such that if you really love your family, there's no way you're going to run for president generally, right? <laughs> because what? I love my family. I'm not going to see him for the next 10 years. No, that's, that's not how it works. Um, Bush is also somewhat insecure. And that, that comes out in his time in, the, in prep school and his time in the Ivory League, in, in the Ivy League, um, uh, at both business school and as, as an undergrad. Um, and I think that insecurity leads him sometimes to be, it goes along with the lack of integrative complexity. Uh, he'll set a course and not change it. He also tends to personalize issues. Uh, actually, the Bush family generally takes loyalty very, very, very seriously. Um, connections are very important. Loyalty, Americans think, is a good thing, uh, except when, inter when it intervenes with confidence. And I, I think one of the president's key flaws, like Harry Truman, actually, his hero, is being too loyal to people who he needed to fire, uh, who he needed to hold accountable. Um, Okay, I'll try to move ahead on this. What went right? Uh, I argue in the paper, and Hassan McGuinn will argue later today, that no child left behind went right. Stephen Skoranek argued, argued that effective presidents are battering rams. They take on existing policies and batter them down because the office is very limited constitutionally. And he and others argue great presidents expand the power of the office. In education, that was George W. Bush. He was very idealistic about education. He knew a lot about education. Um, he actually agreed with the Democrats pretty much. And I always say compromise is easy when you get your way. Um, and so Bush was able to push this issue ahead and, and, and get a law passed that I think is in the initial stages of remaking American public schools. We've never before measured whether kids are learning or not. Some of us actually think that's relevant. Um, many educational administrators do not. And hey, I don't blame them. Enron didn't think that we should have honest accounting, right? Uh, but you know, I, I think that NCLB has turned out to be a good law. It's done a lot more good than harm. And I think 30, 40 years down the road, schools will be a lot better than they are now. And I think we need to give President Bush some of the credit for that. His personality traits, steadfastness, uh, optimism, idealism, pushing things forward worked for NCLB. And it was an area where, frankly, he didn't have to compromise because Democrats, to a good degree, agreed with him. Um, uh, and it was an area that he knew well enough to test his, his ability to learn new stuff and integrative complexity. What went wrong? Obviously, Iraq. David Barrett's always made this case. I think he's absolutely right. Uh, I'll sort of rush through this pretty quickly. Um, had Iraq gone well, I think Bush would be at about 50% in the polls now, and I think we would be talking about President-elect McCain. 
and I think the Republicans would still have Congress. Iraq went horribly wrong. We may yet salvage a victory out of it. Uh, the surge seems to have worked. But for at least the first three years, it went horribly wrong. Now, I was in Washington much of the 90s, and I actually think the case for invading Iraq was extremely strong, and I, and I, I always tell this to my students. You know, given limited intelligence, I think there was a very strong case. Jim and I, I think, disagree about that, and we'll maybe talk about it later today. Um, given what Saddam had done before and what the CIA had failed to predict, 1980, Iraq invaded Iran. 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. 1991, when the CIA said it would be very hard, it was very easy to defeat Saddam Hussein's forces. 1991, we found out when we were occupying Iraq briefly, or we had lots of inspectors there, that they were actually very close to getting nuclear weapons. Pretty scary. Um, 94, we thought we had disarmed Iraq. There were some key defectors. We found out we had not disarmed Iraq. They still had major WMD programs. 1998, Saddam kicked out the weapons inspectors, so we no longer had very good intelligence on what was going on there. Uh, American intelligence services, most Western European intelligence services by then concluded there probably were major WMD programs in Iraq, but it wasn't really at the top of the agenda until 9-11, when foreign policy came to the fore and people who said this has to be a priority were listened to. I think a final thing nobody remarks on is the easy win in Afghanistan. The CIA and lots of others thought that it would be very, very hard to dislodge the Taliban. After all, 100,000 troops failed to do it. How could we do it with 400 Navy SEALs? Well, we did in about, in about two months. Um, I think that easy victory led to a sense of hubris in approaching Iraq. And this led President Bush, I think, to go with his gut and not give this the time and attention it went to. And so what characterizes, I think there's a very strong case for going to war. I think there is no strong case for how we went to war. There was no bureaucratic coherence. Bush did not force contending actors like Colin Powell and Secretary of, uh, Secretary of State Powell, Secretary of Defense, Wein uh, <laughs> Secretary of Defense um, Rumsfeld to work together. On Rumsfeld's advice, we went in with half the recommended number of troops. Uh, Ken Pollack wrote a very good book, the, the Threatening Storm, about the case to invade Iraq back in 2002. He said go in with a minimum 300,000 troops. Otherwise, the most likely outcome was either a new dictator or a civil war. That looks like a pretty good prediction. Um, there were no efforts to employ the Iraqi army. Uh, Paul Bremer disbanded the Iraqi army and essentially told them there is no role for you now in Iraq, but go home and keep your guns. What exactly do we expect to have happen after that? President Bush was asleep at the switch when that happened. There was also no tactical flexibility. By spring of 2003, three months into the invasion, it was clear that Rumsfeld's plan for the invasion had failed. Ronald Reagan, I think, George Herbert Walker Bush, Bill Clinton, I think at this point would have, failed, would have fired Rumsfeld and put someone else in his place. President Bush did not do that. Uh, I think after Hurricane Katrina, Bush should have fired um, Homeland Security Chief Chertoff. He, he still hasn't been fired. Um, there are things more important than loyalty. One of them is holding people accountable. The Bush administration showed no taxable flexibility and tactical flexibility that comes from the top. Um, you've got to keep, you've got, President Bush kept his failures and punished his successes. Rumsfeld was kept, Colin Powell was gotten rid of. Um, what went wrong? I think it's reflected in Bush's psychology. Boldness and optimism combined though with an inattention to detail. Too great an attention to detail, going beyond Reagan in that regard. Um, too much cognitive rigidity, too much inflexibility, too much insecurity on issues that he doesn't really understand, and the, and the unwillingness to dive in and learn those issues. Um, and too much of a tendency to personalize policy. Rummy's our guy, so we're not going to get rid of him. Um, I, I, think, I think the Bush tragedy really is a Bush tragedy. President Bush had so many admirable characteristics, had so many good ideas for the country, did, did some things very well and had a lot of good people in government, and yet ultimately I think will go down as a failed president. And that, I think, should be a lesson to us all. And the final thing I'll sort of throw in on that, dig at my own colleagues, uh, not here, but lots of other colleagues. I see lots of academics who are incredibly critical of President Bush for things like not listening to alternative voices around him and not being willing to change their minds. And a lot of these same professors are still defending the Marxist states and saying it's a damn shame we won the Cold War. And some are even saying, well, we didn't really win the Cold War. And well, Soviet Union really wasn't Marxist. And, and you know, Ronald Reagan didn't do good things with the economy. And welfare reform didn't work, and so on and so forth. I think the, the lesson of George W. Bush is a lesson for us all to be tentative in our judgments and to be willing to change when the real world shows us that things are not working out the way our theories proposed. With that, I will turn this over to a brilliant person who has been in the real world and been in academia. Uh, Al Feltzenberg has taught at a number of institutions, currently teaching, I think, at both Penn and Princeton. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, what? 
Tom, you're not going to talk, are you? I'll let you. All right, well, let me turn it over then to Tom, Tom Lansford, my colleague at Southern Mess. I'm sorry. Um, go for it. Not quite the uh, brilliant Al. I uh, demand <laughs> a recap. I think Bob earlier said that he knew Al and I was no Al, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'd just like to, uh, very quickly, since, since we are tied on time, I'd, I'd just like to raise a few themes that I, I think would be helpful as we go through today and listen to a variety of viewpoints on the Bush presidency. Uh, I, I think the points that my colleagues have made about the dichotomy that exists between those who love President Bush and, and those who hate President Bush is, is very important. Uh, a recent poll of historians found that uh, almost 61% of current historians thought that the Bush presidency was absolutely the worst in American history, uh, which I think is very telling in terms of the ability of, of academics to employ the objectivity uh, for which we are supposed to use as the tools of our trait. Uh, but, but it's not something that, that's, that's relatively uh, new or, or uncommon. Uh, but we have a president in, in the person of George W. Bush who at the one level had the highest approval ratings in American history and at the same time a few years later also had the lowest popular approval ratings. Uh, I think generally when we try and rank presidents, uh, it exists on two levels. The first is a popular level and that popular level of ranking of the presidency really goes to the old uh, Reagan quote, you know, is the country better now than it was when the president was elected. And I think most Americans looking at a president, whether it's a Bill Clinton or a Ronald Reagan, tend not to look so much at policy or accomplishments of the president so much as they, they go by this gut level reaction and say, okay, is the country better now than it was before this person was elected? And to that extent, Bush is going to have a difficult time uh, being resurrected, unlike a Reagan, unlike a Truman, for instance. Uh, at the same time, to pick up on the, uh, the, the point that my colleague uh, Bob uh, brought up, presidential uh, scholars tend to judge presidents on the notion of is the office of the presidency stronger now than it was when that president came in. Uh, and to that extent, I, I think uh, history may be a little bit more nuanced in its judgment of Bush because Bush certainly has expanded the powers of the presidency. Uh, and, and we'll talk much more about that, and, and scholars much more learned than I will discuss that in some detail. But we will have these two trends going forward. The first is the popular perception of Bush's presidency, uh, and the second will be the academic and more scholarly uh, perception. Uh, the, the fact that Bush leaves office with, with such a degree of unpopularity in and of itself is, is not telling uh, in terms of his potential for rehabilitation. Uh, as mentioned, his uh, hero is Harry Truman, who of course left office uh, highly unpopular. Uh, when asked about his uh, unpopularity, Truman said being president is, is sort of like being a jackass in a hailstorm. You just have to sit there and take it. Uh, and to some extent, this has been, and again tying in with, with Bob's comments, this has been uh, a trait of George W. Bush. Bush has not allowed public opinion has not allowed uh, uh, criticism, et cetera, in many cases to alter his, his judgments. And I think that's important because I would also like to raise the, uh, the point, which we can discuss in, in some detail, that I believe Americans tend to elect presidents that are the opposite of the previous president. And if you have a president who tends to be governed by polls, uh, the next president that is elected tends to be more self-assured, uh, tends to be less uh, willing to, to listen to, to popular opinion. And, and I, I think if you look at the succession of presidents that we've had recently, we see those traits. In many ways, George W. Bush was the, was the anti-Bill Clinton. I mean, George W. Bush was always on time, was someone who took the office of the presidency very seriously, uh, was someone who was very uh, loving and very caring of his family. Uh, traits that at the time in 2000 did resonate with, with uh, a, a, you know, a, a significant portion of the American population. Going forward long term, how will all of this play out? Well, uh, the first thing I would say that uh, for us to judge Dor George W. Bush, I think what we probably ought to do is all just uh, leave it alone for about 10 years. <laughs> 
and, and then come back and try and make some assessments. Uh, it's fascinating to look, and, and, and I hate to admit this, but uh, uh, last night I was looking at Wikipedia uh, and their article on ranking presidents. And what was great about it is it actually had all of the recent polls that have been done, I shouldn't say recent, all of the polls ranking the president, going back to Schlesinger's uh, 48 polls in comparison. And what was great about that was to see the ebb and flow of presidential greatness, to see uh, a, a Truman steadily march up, to see uh, a, a Kennedy sort of kind of go down a little bit. Uh, and I think more than anything else, what that tells us is, is time is the ultimate uh, arbitrator, is the ultimate uh, way for which we'll uh, judge the presidencies. And uh, I think I'm digging into the question and answer period, so I'll, I'll just sort of draw down with that, and I'll turn it over to, again, the brilliant Al. <laughs> And mention Al's book. <laughs> Al has his book. Al has his book. All right. Hi. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Uh, I want to get to the questions. I have a few uh, very quick uh, observations. Um, uh, first of all, the disclaimer I should point out, I spent a brief time in my life working for both presidents named Bush, but we'll talk more about that later, but I want to do the disclaimer. A uh, couple of things. I got into this rating game because I started with the belief we heard earlier that most historians, and usually true, most historians think that great presidents were presidents who advanced uh, the office, advanced the power of the federal government. Uh, liberals began to rethink this when we had a thing called Vietnam, uh, followed by Watergate, uh, which got me thinking for many, many years that um, uh, the consequences of what presidents do, perhaps are much more important, uh, this is what happens when you let the political scientists join the historians in filling out these ballots, because we look at procedure. That's what political science love. So why is Andrew Jackson always a near great president? Well, he expanded the office, didn't he? Uh, veto power, uh, patronage, uh, president's control of his party in Congress, ramp things through. Well, then I look at things like um, the um, question of the Cherokee. And I used to say, well, if genocide's your plan, Jackson's your man. Uh, he rams it through Congress through uh, bribery, cajolery, uh, theft, in any way he could do it. Uh, the court, Supreme Court tells him that he has no jurisdiction over this, that uh, uh, basically that the uh, state government cannot take away land given them in a treaty by none other than Thomas Jefferson, one of Jackson's alleged heroes. The response was, well, John Marshall rendered his ruling, let him enforce it. Well, and we know the rest of this. The federal cavalry is sent out to do the work of a state militia. Well, uh, lawless presidency. And I say, what? Consequential. Strength in the office. Uh, Jackson himself, farewell address. What are you most proud of? Well, he's proud of the bank. Well, first presidentially induced depression, we could point out. Uh, he's proud of stopping the nullification issue and secession. Well, perhaps. Perhaps he put the Civil War off for a couple of years. One out of three is not a near great president, but political scientists love the man. So I said, why don't we find some ways, when I wrote this book, um, how do we distinguish what we're talking about? Now, I don't think you can ever uh, take the bias out of the what I call the rating game, but I think you can control your bias to a degree. So I looked, I said, OK, it's a parlor game. You too can play it. You don't have to be a historian. You don't have to have tenure. You don't even maybe have to know how to read. Uh, but I look at about uh, six criteria that are mine. And I said, um, character, we can come back to that later, which is really, I think, uh, the key to this presidency, like many others. We'll come back to it. Uh, vision. Why do they want the job? Was it the right vision for the country at the time, which gets back to the passage of time? Confidence. Well, there, there, there's Jackson in space. But with the vision right, it's the character right. And then I look at what three pres all presidents do. Uh, they all have to deal with the economy, one way or the other. They can make it better, they can make it worse, they can be like Calvin Coolidge and just run out of the way and let it go. Uh, they can deal with national security. Was the country more safe or less safe, more secure or less secure? And I don't only mean militarily. Uh, at the end of their term. And then here we get to the Jackson question. Do they expand or constrict freedom, uh, liberty? Uh, America's role in the world, and I don't only mean, again, militarily, that great city on a hill. Was it shiny or was it dimmer? Uh, and of course, I was just credited by one of the magazines for raising, helping to raise the profile of U.S. Grant. I'm very glad <laughs> you no longer mentioned U.S. Grant among the traditional failures. 
Uh, I think there's a question here of a president who attempted both things, uh, perhaps was underdone by the times. Uh, and uh, we always talk about Eisenhower, uh, first president in 80 years. We have to fill in 
the box from lots of incomplete information of lots of employees and have some refugees and everything else. And and usually when policymakers are trying to make sense of that, I mean, the, the book I always tell people to read is Robert Jervis's wonderful perception and misperception of politics. And we never really know what the facts are. We tend to interpret them through the lens of history. And so I think both the CIA and policymakers and the administration use the history of the early 90s and the 80s to interpret, um, frankly, the very unclear uh, uh, intelligence that we had on the WMDs. Uh, I think it was a rational thing to do. I think And he thought they were gone. And he was absolutely right. And what the guy who I really want to talk to and should have a role in the Obama administration is Scott Ritter. I, I kind of believe, I'm an old-fashioned Republican, I kind of believe he should reward success. But, um, but I, I would just emphasize that we frankly just didn't know that much. So we were grafting on interpretations based on history, which is, I, I think, the best you can do. Are there any, any other thoughts in the audience while we're, while we're here? Uh, maybe I should, and while we're waiting for a brilliant question to form in someone's mind, I'll ask a less brilliant uh, question. Uh, some of you talked about boldness in the office. I know Bill Clinton used to lament that he wasn't destined to be president in great times. He, 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 he was looking at the sausage Paul too, and, and he sees most of them are, are, are war presidents. Yet I look at that and I say, well, to some extent, Theodore Roosevelt made his own times. People weren't demanding uh, those national parks. Uh, other people tried to do a Panama Canal, and he did it. It wasn't uh, perhaps uh, the first in anybody's list. And he was the only one, if you remember, to want the great white fleet and the great navy. The Speaker of the House wasn't so sure about this. The Speaker of the House is not an imperialist. And uh, Roosevelt said, well, that's very good. We've got enough uh, appropriations to send the sailors halfway around the world. And uh, Congress could explain to their parents why they're not coming home. Uh, so um, to what extent can they? Uh, unlike Bill Clinton's thought, to what extent can they make their times, and to what extent are they a victim of them? Maybe all of you have a thought on that. I, may I start? Yeah, okay. please. Um, first of all, Theodore Rosa, as you rightly pointed out, is a very important president because he uh, helped create the moving towards the modern presidency. The 19th century presidency, if you look at the Constitution of the United States of America, the, the Article One is very, very short, uh, or very, very long. That's Article One is the Congress is the most important part. Article Two is the presidency, and it's very, very short. I think the founders believed the president was sort of more of as, a, as of a chief clerk than anything else. So Theodore Roosevelt helped expand presidential powers, and so did Woodrow Wilson. Eventually, of course, Franklin Roosevelt would, would very much do that. Now. Um, I think presidents can, if, 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 they're, if, they're, if they're tactically, if they know what they're doing, they can certainly set their own agendas and, and, and push things through, as you said about Theodore Roosevelt. George Bush tried to do this with Social Security privatization. He did not really run on it in 2004. Right. He chose to try to pursue it. He also promised the Medicare prescription drug benefit in his 2000 election campaign, and he came through and did deliver it. Even though we might argue the Medicare prescription drug benefit did not have enough cost controls, et cetera, um, and uh, was maybe not well crafted. So he had one entitlement success and one, not, one, and one entitlement uh, idea that did not succeed at all and, and really hurt him. Um, I'll argue that the prescription drug benefit was not a great success from a policy angle, even though it was a, a, a big success in getting it through uh, in three hours after midnight um, through Congress. In so, a Jacksonian way. In a Jacksonian way. <laughs> right, right. The battering ram. Yeah. The, the, ba the battering ram. So, um, so, so, so he's tried to create his own times. I don't think he was anywhere near successful as Theodore Roosevelt was a um, hundred years ago. Um, but uh, he, he certainly tried, and, and it may be harder to do now than when Theodore Roosevelt did it because the system is, 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 is there's more, it's more, it's more complicated, and there's, uh, the, and there's more uh, money out there, and there's more, uh, and there's more just individuals and bodies out there and interest groups. What about the rest of you? Yeah. Uh, I think you make a great point about, you know, there's the debate of you have to have greatness, quote unquote, thrust upon you. Um, but Roosevelt, I think, uh, an example of basically make, making your own making your own legacy um, based on what you're dealt with. I think there's there's some aspects there's some aspect to um, you know, having the political times be right and and being bold. But uh, I think Roosevelt is definitely a special example. Um, 
One thing I always I always considered about the, the the theories that say like if you're bold that necessarily means you're good. Your example mm -hmm. of Jackson is is great. I mean, what if you're bold and you do something really bad? I mean, that's that's something I think that the scholarly theories don't really always uh, take into account. Uh, I, I would actually just pick up on the point that Jeremy raised about it being more difficult to be a bold president. Uh, I, I think you could argue that probably our last significantly bold president was probably Reagan, who came into office at a time when most people thought the Cold War was uh, locked in a status quo uh, situation that was not going to dramatically change. And, and, and Reagan came in both domestically and in terms of foreign policy, had an agenda that, that to, to some extent reshaped uh, both American foreign policy and American domestic policy. I, I think boldness in contemporary American politics is, is often punished more than it's rewarded. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because if you do have boldness, the American public would like to see a 100% success. If you have an 80% success, it, it's not good enough. We've mm -hmm. raised expectations uh, both of our political leaders and indeed other uh, public figures to, to such a degree that it's it's almost impossible for them to succeed. And uh, we could talk about a whole variety of reasons for that, but uh, I, I think it's going to be difficult for us to have a bold president. Indeed, you know, Obama is not a bold president. His election was a bold uh, step in American politics, but Obama as a politician is very cautious, mm -hmm. is very uh, uh, deliberative, uh, and, and in many ways sort of the opposite of, uh, mm -hmm. of Bush. Mm -hmm. Any of the others? Uh, I, no, there are, uh, Bob, please. I, I, I would just add, there's the old Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times, may you live in bold times. <laughs> no questions from the audience uh, at all. Uh, let me uh, you pick, Let me say something. You picked up, uh, mentioned Obama. Let me pick up on the president-elect. Um, uh, the current president-elect, I, I remember, uh, helped uh, tick off his uh, predecessor, his esteemed predecessor, Bill Clinton, when we into such another era now. Say, it was Obama right? <laughs> I say the potential exists for him to be a transformational president, um, but I mean it, that's going to that's going to take time, depending on what he does. But I think the, the his election, I think, was pretty significant and can be one of those like regime changing elections. So Skravonik should be taking out his notebook. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we have a. I think there's two um, key components. One is whether Obama succeeds in ameliorating the ec economic financial crisis we're having now, whether, whether he's able to, um, whether the times, whether it improves. The second one is um, whether he's, he's successful with national health insurance, some, some version of that in his first term. Uh, I, I would just say almost all presidents come into office uh, with a desire to focus initially on domestic policy. And, and in th these circumstances, uh, Obama really has no choice. And I think Jeremy's right in, in terms of the current economic crisis. The problem, though, is that ultimately, I think Obama's legacy is tied to his foreign policy and, and to America's standing in the world. Uh, whether you like or, or hate Bush, the reality is that America's soft power, its ability to uh, transform or, 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 or export its values and traditions uh, around the world, which, which for so long was really the defining uh, component of American far, foreign policy, has been seriously eroded. I, I mean, you know, in Tiananmen Square in, in 89, the, the Chinese were, were singing We Shall Overcome and had uh, copies of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, you don't see that today. America is not a popular country. Uh, and it's something that will take a president, it will, will take an administration many years to rebuild. So if Obama comes into office and focuses, much like Bill Clinton did, mainly on domestic policy for his first few years, I think he, he will miss an important opportunity to really uh, achieve that kind of transformative presidency. Um, I, I think that, that something that nobody remarks about Obama is that if he does absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing, doesn't get out of bed in the morning for the next four years, his two biggest campaign promises will be achieved. Um, the Bush tax cuts are term limited. They go away in, what, two years, I think. Um, so he gets to raise taxes without taking the political hit for doing it. It's great. Um, the, the other one is um, Iraq is winding down. Um, it, things are actually going fairly well. We have an agreement with the Iraqis. We're going to be out of there in two years. So his two biggest promises will be achieved if, if he does nothing at all, and that gives him a huge advantage. What gives him a huge disadvantage that nobody's talking about, the elephant in the room, although Jeremy alluded to it, 
is aging baby boomers. Baby boomers are retiring, baby boomers are having increased health care needs. That's going to suck a lot out of this economy. And I think that America will be kind of like Japan in the 90s and Europe for the last 25 years, where basically there will be zero growth. Uh, it will be flatlined for probably the next 10 years. And it won't be a depression, but people will think it is because we're used to really good growth. Um, and I, I think that's going to make it probably kind of difficult for him in, in, uh, in 2012. Um, but we'll see. I think a key thing that Al alluded to is you have to have good ideas. And I don't know what Barack Obama's ideas are. He didn't really run a platform oriented. His, his race was, I'm not Bush, which is true. And I think, I think most of us, I think all of us almost want someone who isn't Bush. But, um, but beyond that, there wasn't much of a platform he ran on. And because of that, he, he, got, a, he got a mandate, but without a message. Um, there's no clear, you know, when Reagan was elected, we knew what he was going to do. When Clinton was elected, we knew what he was going to do. With Obama, I, I get the feeling he's kind of making it up as he goes along. In my area of education, teachers unions think he's their guy, and education reformers think he's their guy. One of us has got to be wrong, um, but uh, nobody really knows. So I, I think it's, it's going to be really fascinating to watch this evolve. One important point is that Franklin Roosevelt did not run when he ran for president. Didn't have didn't say much yeah. in his uh, when he ran for president about what he was going to do, and he had a transformational domestic early presidency. That's true. Whereas Ronald Reagan clearly did. In fact, uh, one of the Obama they don't leak very much, but somebody <laughs> did leak before the debates. One of the debates that uh, he is spending time dealing with Reagan's speeches. <laughs> Not Reagan's ideas, but Reagan's speeches. And Reagan had a way of painting a picture for the world of what they could envision uh, a century hence. And that great speech in 1976, and Reagan was at the, the uh, Republican convention, this was a speech that he was going to give had he been the nominee. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to uh, contribute to a time capsule. And I gave him a copy of the LA Times for the day I was asked, and I gave him a copy of the local high school yearbook couple of neckties, they can see how we silly people used to dress. Uh, and then it dawned on me that a century from now when they open that time capsule, they will know whether those nuclear weapons were fired. They will know whether, whether freedom advanced or retreated. They will know, well, well back to Obama's, Obama's great speech in Grant Park in Chicago. Uh, this, the, the, when people look back on these times, this was the moment when we looked at our economic problems. This was the moment when we came together. This, well, he's been studying. And uh, you know, I would add to Bob Morano's great list up there, uh, uh, the ability to communicate, the ability to capture an audience, the ability, ability to uh, let the audience in on the dream. I mean, he's been, he studied a master, whether he, he ran on a, on a specific program or not. Audience, I'm begging you, this is a very articulate actually, audience. Some actually, of you were quite actually, animated last night, so maybe I should just call on you. We should actually close it off now. <laughs> All right, you want to close it off? We have to go. We All right, final it. question. Going once? Okay, I've been ordered to close it off. The leaders we deserved, and a few we didn't. History of the presidential reigning game. Thank you. Bye-bye.